the last, first, last, and only investor panel uh, in this event. And 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 when we uh, when we ba when we were backstage, <laughs> Mickey told us kindly that all the investors investor panels are boring. <laughs> uh, so that was our preparation. So we try to make a non-boring investor panel. Uh, so I let the investors first uh, uh, say a few words about themselves and then meanwhile prepare some questions. So you will drive this panel discussion. So there will be a person circling there and you will have to ask questions. So prepare some questions and then we'll uh, try to answer them. And this is a great group of people so don't be afraid to, to ask them. So let's start from uh, Christian. Yes, hey, I'm Christian, uh, glad to be here. I'm with eVentures, and uh, we're pretty international, early stage venture capital firm investing in the US, Europe, Russia, Asia, and Brazil. And um, anything consumer internet, mobile, early stage stuff is uh, what we like. Hi, I'm Manad from DN Capital. Uh, we invest in early stage and growth in software, digital media, mobile, and e-commerce. We focus on the UK, Germany, and the Nordics, as well as the US. We have an office in London and Silicon Valley, and actually soon in Berlin. Uh, we're very interested in, in, the, in the Nordics, seen some great companies today, and look forward to some very uh, interesting questions. And my name is uh, Roberto Bonanzinga. I work for a firm called Boulderton Capital. I'm one of the partners there. We started the firm in 2000 as a benchmark Europe. We have about $2 billion under management. And we invest from you know, a couple of hundred K up to 15, 20, 30 million dollars. And you know, what we get is great ideas. So hi, I'm uh, Max from Axel Partners. Uh, Axel is uh, the world's largest uh, venture capital firm. Uh, offices in Palo Alto, London, New York, India, China. Um, we love Finland. We're invested in two companies here, um, in uh, Rovio and cool. Supercell. Yep. Uh, very excited to do more. Um, we we've backed products like Facebook, Spotify, Groupon, uh, ClickTech in Sweden, which is one of the big European successes. So very excited to be here. Thanks, guys. Uh, and I'm Petteri Koponen from Lifeline Ventures. So we're, we're an early stage investor. We invest anything between 50,000 and 2 million euros. And we're quite local, so we mostly in, invest in Finnish startups uh, together with investors like 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 the guys here um, okay so let's let's get the first questions from the from the audience who has the the first question over there hi my name is Pekka Lietov I come from a company called One Digit a Finnish company called fresh startup do you guys have any difficulties to invest in music companies? For example, uh, similar to Pandora.com or for example, uh, Spotify? I take that. Well, uh, I'm an early investor in Shazam, uh, which is a music app where you recognize music with your phone, so no. And we invested also in MPMe uh, earlier this year. We, in fact, it's a company we incubated inside DN, so very interested. I think everyone's open to music. It's a big space. I mean, it's obviously a, a quite challenging space because you have more constraints than in other spaces. We are investing in a company that is a bit under the radar screen, but it's extremely famous in the music world, that is called Cobalt, that actually helps artists around the world, some of the top artists around the world, to collect their royalties. So we don't have any belief, again, a priori. It's more about you know, what exactly is the idea, what is the team about. Well. Um, so, music presents unique challenges, I think, um, from a startup point of view, because you're very dependent on large companies that, that sit on the intellectual property that you're about to sell access to, or depending on what you do with it, discovery um, or, or consumption. We've invested in Spotify. We're obviously very happy with how that company has been performing. Um, I was a personal investor in Last.fm, and right. I can tell you, kind of, if you are not well financed, it's a long uphill battle, um, you know, getting those contracts, getting, getting all the majors to do deals with you. Um, if I were, I've been an entrepreneur twice, if I were choosing a segment to go into, um, I think music would be, um, wouldn't be my first choice uh, because you, you just need to raise a lot of money to make it um, and hence 
wherever your company ends up, you're going to carry around a large preference stack that probably minimizes your return rather, rather, than, um, you know, rather than owning a large percent of that company. So um, you can do it, and it's phenomenal because the consumer interest and appetite for music is great. But um, if you're starting with a fresh sheet of paper, it, not necessarily the first one I would pick. Can, can, can I just uh, entertain the audience? So I actually I completely disagree with this Toby point of view because I, I actually think that uh, you know, this idea that you look at patterns and that you look at segments and you draw conclusions is uh, you know, an investor-led view of the world. The truth is that uh, the most interesting things are things that we have never seen before. So maybe there is something in the music space that some of you can do that is extremely disruptive, and everything we have been learning in the music space for the last 15 years is a pile of shit. You know, and I think the thing is it always comes down to the team, and you, know, you have to find the right investor. Like, I've been very stupid. I passed on SoundCloud when it was a seed opportunity, right? And I, I unfortunately did not believe in it. I was extremely wrong. That's what we call our inverse portfolio that, you know, is actually great as well. And I think for all of us, probably we have a fantastic inverse portfolio, opportunities we passed on just because we didn't see it. So I think, you know, if you're the right team, you feel you have a great value proposition, um, just keep looking for an investor who's passionate about what you're about to do. The key point is, guys, great investments is not about consensus. Absolutely. But uh, good, Roberto, are you saying that you don't see any patterns in the founders, for example? Or I, I, we really believe that when something is fashionable and it's consensus, usually there is not much money to make. Uh, so le let's do a very quick poll. And, and Max is biased here, so you don't have to participate. I will. Uh, you can, okay, so no conflict, no it, it, interest. Okay, so it's actually even more important, interesting then. Uh, do you guys think that uh, $3 billion is a reasonable valuation for Spotify? Is that a good investment? And raise your hand if you think it's, uh, it's good. It's a good investment, you mean? At three billion dollars, or for at, these guys? At three. Because <laughs> <laughs> these it, guys, I think, it's pretty clear that it's been yeah. a good investment. Yeah. <laughs> Is it a good investment at three billion dollars? Raise your hand. Well, I, I don't think it's a good venture investment for us at three billion dollars, but I think as a company, I think it definitely has the potential to be a three billion, even ten billion dollar company, because it's an amazing product. Now, the issue sure. with the royalties with the musicians. And the, and the labels, I don't know whether they're going to get a business model that really makes sense, but I think it's a fantastic product. I mean, I use it all the time. I'm sure most people here use it all the time. Okay, thanks. Uh, any, the next question from the audience, who has there? It's a dangerous strategy. Hi, guys. I'm Christopher from Holvi. We're completely reinventing traditional banking. Um, you guys, most of you mentioned early stage. I, I know that Max kind of drops the early stage in most of the stuff. No? Okay. No. You're all early stage. I think there's a bit of confusion about what early stage means for many companies. Um, could you define that? Not in terms of valuation, but in terms of what you're looking to see in the company. Okay. Well, you start. Yeah. So I think, you know, when I mean early stage, from a financial point of view, it means that we're typically the first institutional investor, so the only money in before, if any, has been angel money. But maybe more importantly for you, from a product point of view, it means that there is more than a PowerPoint, because that would be seed stage or angel stage, whatever you want to call it, but that there is a product that we can kind of touch in a way where at least it's a prototype. Ideally, it's out in the market and there is initial user feedback. So, you know, product release stage is kind of how we define early stage. Um, then, you know, it goes on for quite a while to still be early stage until you do significant revenues because then it becomes a bit of a blur as to when you're not considered early stage anymore. And that's where it's really getting crazy. But, you know, in terms of being, when can I start to institutional investors, I think around the time you have product ready to go to market is, you know, one reasonable uh, criterion to look at. So I guess for us, uh, early stage is probably a little bit earlier. We're a little bit smaller funds. So, for instance, we've backed many companies where a guy's come to us, 
with nothing except a PowerPoint. So for instance, OLX, Fabrice Grinda, uh, uh, AppSmart with Rahul Power, an ex-Shazam engineer. So we like to really back the person. So we're all about the DNA of the person and obviously looking at the market. And, and we'll basically put a little bit of money just on an idea and test it. And then obviously put much more money as it, as it shows progression. I mean, the reality is any one of us is going to put money if we think it's a great guy and a great product and we're excited. Then, you know, we forget all about the stages and all these things. Then it's about, hey, this looks like a great deal, looks like a great proposition, let's go for it. And also there's a reason for that. If I don't do that and Max gets there, I'll never see it again. <laughs> so, so, uh, <laughs> what, what about if, if, you put, if you put in a little money? Do you really, do you, can you really work for the company? So are you just seeing where they go? So, so, so I, I have a view on that because having a fund that is, you know, we have $2 billion and the management of $100 million in the active fund, I get this question quite a lot, right? So I think there are two logics around that. There are some people, big, big funds, they, they do 20, 40 very early stage investments as a way to buy optionality for the investment on the future. Mm. Good luck if you are an entrepreneur that works with these firms. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, there is a logic about the level of funding and financing. It's not bad or wrong, but it's a specific logic. For instance, in my case, I do something completely different. I do some early stage investments in which I put, you know, 250K. Just, uh, you know, we did, there is a PowerPoint presentation, but uh, I fundamentally don't make any difference if I put 250K of $5 million or $15 million. And I do more or less, you know, a few per year, a couple maximum. And uh, my key driver is, uh, independently if the entrepreneur needs 100K or $10 million, that idea has got the potential to be three, five hundred million dollars opportunity. If he has got that potential, I don't care of the stage. You know, we invested in Wonga, that you were from the financial services, you know, where the guy sh show up in our office with a PowerPoint presentation. We invested in VUGA when there was no any concept of the first game that was being created. We invest in Ticktail in Sweden when there was no concept of the product. So what about Max? You have a huge fund. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, when it comes to the definition of early stage, the, the way I like to think about it is the, um, is the product market fit way, which is, you know, seed stage is prototype, series A, series B is, is, is pre, pro, hopefully approaching product market fit. And then growth capital is post-product market fit, where it's all about getting it into, this, into, uh, into more people's hands. The, um, if you think about you know, those stages, it's essentially about building the product, proving that the business works, and then scaling the business. So early stage encompasses everything that is, is where you are still proving the business. Right? If you've gotten to a point where your unit economics are worked out, you can probably call it growth, even though the, the, you know, depending on how large the segment is that you're targeting, the money you raise does not look like growth financing. Um, I think in terms of the, the, the size of a fund, it, it is a unique challenge in Europe. There is a market opportunity from a venture point of view, but a real problem from an entrepreneur's point of view where um, there's a lot of seed capital available nowadays. You know, there's a glut of incubators, accelerators, angel funds. Um, and there's all these little companies kind of raising 500K and, 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 and being very hopeful about the future. And then we have a gap in the market between a million euros to maybe seven, eight million euros, right? Where, where there just are not a lot of firms doing those types of deals. Um, and so from a European entrepreneur's point of view, um, that presents a, a real challenge vis-a-vis -vis the US. Um, so what I would do and what I did with my last company always is once you've raised that seed money, try and build towards product market fit already. Um, just so that you're not dependent on follow-on financing that comes from Europe, because it's very, very difficult at Series A. So, talking about early stage investments, and, uh, and, and this is kind of one of the problems that I see with, in these startup events, that there's a lot of companies pitching, like there's probably 500 startups here, and probably like you are not going to invest in 498 of them, uh, so why? Kind of, what's the? I've been thinking about this. Why don't these events lead into investments? So, what's the biggest? What's the biggest reason for that? Well, I'm, I'm not sure that's entirely true because I met a company last night that actually I'm pretty hot about, and I might invest in it. So. And if I hadn't come here, I wouldn't have met that company. So yes, our job is to sort through 
all of the stuff, and that's how we, why we get, what we get paid for. Yeah. So that's one company out of 500, We're which is fun. good, by Max the way. Max can do yeah, five. Yeah. But what do you think? Like, it's, uh, Roberto, you visit a lot of events, you everywhere, so what, what's the gap between the early stage companies here and then really getting the investment? I, I think it has less to do with events, but it's more of a general tip to all the entrepreneurs, right? Um, you want to capture the imagination of the investor. Think of the investor as your customer, right? And, you know, the smartest guys, what do they do? They use social media as a way to interact, right? I mean, I make a big deal, you know, a few years ago, the cool venture capitalists were the venture capitalists you could not reach out to. You know, the venture capitalist you had to call his secretary and the secretary of the secretary, that was the cool guy. I think today is changing because of social media. You know, everybody's exposed, everybody's out there. So my point is events are never ending. My suggestion to the 498 companies, if you believe that you have great products, bombard the right investors with angles around your product and make us playing with your product. I really believe the product is, at the end, the key, key glue, especially in consumer internet, you know, the key glue between the investors and the entrepreneur. That's really what I think people should use a bit more. So Christian, what would get you excited? Have you seen anything super exciting here? Yeah, you know, I think we've seen actually a few companies that we really like. And to me, it's, you said this before, it's about the people. When, you know, somebody's really excited about what he's doing, that at this early stage is, is what I really care about. And then I just have to believe in what the person tells me in terms of the vision where it could be long term. But frankly, when I'm standing at the booth, I have no way to validate whether that is, you know, very likely, unlikely, whatever, because I probably don't know the business well enough at that point. But what, what gets me excited here, um, especially in the, in the mobile space, is you have a lot of great talent and people doing really interesting things. And, uh, you know, that world has changed over the last few years because with App Stores today, you can be in Finland but have global distribution immediately. And that's sort of a very new opportunity, I think, um, that makes it, you know, uniquely attractive. Um, for, for entrepreneurs here. So I'm very excited about that specifically here. Max. Do you want me to answer the same question? Because we're kind of repeating a little bit. I think from an entrepreneur's point of view, again, I think the venture industry has failed you guys over the last 20 years. European ventures sucks, right? Most guys have not made money. Um, the industry is dying in Germany, in the UK, in France. There's all these traditional early stage investors that are unable to raise new funds. And that, is, that leads to exactly what you're describing, which is that very, very few of you are going to be able to raise institutional capital from kind of traditional institutional venture investors. Yep. Um, now, taking a step back, as there are pools of capital available, such as Index, such as Excel, such as the people represented on the panel, um, that are out there and that are actively doing deals and that are doing sizable deals. How do you position yourself so that you get into that portfolio if that's what you want to do? Because as an entrepreneur, you always need to, you know, you need to think about whether you're aligned with the investor, right? Whether, whether he has the same interests you have. And we actually care a lot about, about making sure that everyone is aligned when we do an investment. Um, I think the things that, that no one, so everyone always questions people in Europe, right? The way to get people to stop questioning you as a person is to have a ton of traction. If you have millions of users, no one's going to be like, oh, I don't think the guy's a good manager, because clearly you're doing it. So traction beats everything. Um, the second is absolutely team. So if you're able to attract a world-class team that is, that is able to impress the venture capital investor, um, that will lead to financing more so than the last thing, which is your technology or your product, right? That's almost, I would want to say, a hygiene factor, which has to do with the fact that most of the guys investing venture in Europe are bad product people. They don't understand product. They don't use the products. Um, you know, they wouldn't know whether you have a sustainable competitive advantage if, you know, unless, they, unless they call some of their friends who, who actually know about that market. I actually think a lack of conviction when it comes to tech is one of the biggest problems we have in venture in Europe today. Um, so as, a, as an early stage guy, try and get to, to a point where you have traction. If you can't, if you can't get traction because your, capital, your, your business is capital intense, build a world-class team around you. And by world-class team, I really mean people that, you know, on the business side, commercial side, that have left Harvard, on the tech side, that have been at an interesting company before, that have some sort of engineering pedigree that's very interesting. Um, you know, and I could go on, but 
that's really it. Okay, cool. Uh, the next question from the audience. Anybody? Maybe something a little controversial. Yeah. And something really hard for these guys. There's, There's one, one question over there. Two. Actually, two. So you can, you can actually find the next, que next question while we are talking here. So, okay, maybe this will be a hard question. So I know that one of the things that investors do is to look for pattern recognition. They look for patterns. So the minute that I step into the door for an investor meeting, I will already not match the pattern of you being 33 because I'm a woman. How do you overcome this pattern recognition default issue? You show me an idea that is a multi-billion dollar and I screw all the, pan, all the patterns I know and I put them in the trash bin. Oh. I couldn't care less. Just show me a multi-billion dollar idea with a great team. And I, I so, think the moment you walk into the door, the pattern recognition is actually not that strong anymore. The, the pattern recognition applies more at the email level when you get proposals kind of, you know, by the dozens. Yeah. And you have to screen them very quickly. And you know, that's kind of where you sort of intuitively build a pattern. But I think once you talk to people, once it's in meetings, I mean, we actually look for the unusual, right? So I think there it's not as bad as, as you actually may think, although we may be pattern-driven guys. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't think the pattern has anything to do with your gender. It's whether you have the mental you know, ability and chutzpah to impress us with what you want to do. It has nothing to do with male or female. I mean, we have female entrepreneurs in our portfolio as well. So have you actually, like, have you invested in, 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 in companies founded by female entrepreneurs? Totally. Because there's very little, like on average, and even less investors. We have in the past, and we have a term sheet for another one right now. Yeah, we're investors yeah. in a company called The Real Real. Um, which is run by Julie Wainwright, um, yeah. sort of very successful entrepreneur out of the U.S., so absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I actually consider it as a positive absolutely. pattern. The same for us. Yeah. Yeah. The same for us. We actually have a great example in Europe of a company where the entrepreneur is, uh, you know, husband and wife, yeah. and uh, it's Bebo, right, that yeah. we sold. We are the only investor that we sold. You know, for a time with fifty million dollars, it was a, it was a, you know a great combination, and not not only that, but you know the CEO was also a woman that was instrumental. That you know then went to run Facebook and is run a shield. And that so, and that is an investment that went completely against any of the, any of the rules in venture capital because it was a husband and wife team, which like all the textbook venture says, hey, don't don't back husband and wife because it's actually problematic, right? Because the alliances are not about. The things anymore. They're, they're, these guys are emotionally so attached to one another. So I think, you know, pattern recognition. All, all that really means is how we kind of sort our portfolio and how we do risk the company over time and what we've seen work and not work. And it's mostly a thing to help you. I think, I think accusing the venture industry of bias is, uh, you know, I, people say venture doesn't take risks. Well, I point you to the ten-year returns, right, of venture in Europe, and they're bad, right? So clearly they've taken enough risk. Right. What, what, what we haven't done well or is, maybe not is enough. generate positive. Or maybe exactly. not enough. Maybe, uh, maybe, not, maybe enough. not the right ones. Yeah, I think you're right. But I, I think also there is another way to look at that. I, I think it might be more interesting for you guys to think about that. You know, I get uh, some about 500, 600 plants per month. So, you know, I'm human. I do my email. I need a way how I can, uh, you know, somehow interact and make a selection because I'm totally bombarded. So the question, how do I make a selection, is sometimes I make the wrong calls. And you know, I have an example of a guy, I, I replied, said, yes, uh, you know, it's a great idea, but no thanks. And the guy said, why no thanks? I explained to him why no thanks. And he wrote to me back and said, look, actually, you are making a mistake, and that's the reason why. And you know what? Not only I invited the guy to come, I also invested in him. So also, there is something to learn yeah. about the way how you describe what you do, right? And, uh, you know, you guys are the entrepreneurs. We are here, GNA, right? Totally useless, right? You are the creative force into this business. So don't take a no as an answer. So let's, let's take the next question. There was one over there. There was a guy there. Could you? 
Yes, we have a mobile company focusing on growth markets like India, Africa, and so on. So if you do investments in companies like uh, from Western countries, like say we have an innovation or product that will be launched in, uh, in these new markets and not locally. What, how do you see this as a, as a kind of, is it problematic or what's your comment on this topic? I can't hear the question. I didn't get the question. Uh, I think the question has to do if we make investments in companies that have products in emerging markets, like India, right? Okay. Uh, for instance, as far as we concern the Boulderton, you know, look, we have a very simple rule. We try to make investments in companies in which we can help. Because if you want cash, you can go to the bank or to many other VCs. We try to help you to build a business. My knowledge of India is zero, so I'm not going to be able to help you. So why do you want me as an investor? Yeah, I think you really have to look at where the funds have some presence because you ultimately want somebody who has some degree of local presence. So, for example, India, we would not invest if it's uh, Brazil, Russia, or, or China and Japan where we have presence. It'd be interesting to us. I think it also depends on what the product is. So, for instance, if it's a digital media product, it's a global product by definition on day one. So, some, a company like Shazam, uh, we're active in, in Brazil, we're active in China, we're active all over the world but we do that out of Silicon Valley in the US. Whereas if it was an e-commerce play in India, we wouldn't touch it because then you need local guys for logistics and all stuff like that. But if it's a digital media or software, no problem. So many of, many, especially many of the consumer web startups here, I mean, the US is, is, is at the moment a primary market. So shouldn't the companies just go for the US investors? Why would they? I mean, they know the market better than you do. So, first of all, good luck if you're a Finnish company getting a US investor if you're still based here. I think it's a lot better to get traction here and then get an investor in Europe that has strong links with the US. And a lot of us do have offices in Silicon Valley. And I would say, so for instance, we've had eight exits in the last 24 months. Seven out of eight were to US buyers. The eighth was South African. So if you don't have connections with the U.S., I think you're at a major disadvantage. Uh, so I think getting connections into the U.S. is critical down the road. I mean, look, when we invested in MySQL, it was mostly a company here, right? One of the key reasons why we invested is because together with our colleague from Benchmark, we actually helped them to go to the U.S. So it's, a, I mean, it's one of, for sure for us, and I think for you guys as well, it's one of the key. Piece. It's one of the pieces where really we can help entrepreneurs a fair bit. So, but can I say just one thing? Because this is a bit. There is something pretty impressive is happening here today, right? And I want to say that, right? Because it's a bit on the negative side that we've been talking about how much we all suck. But uh, you know, this event is one of the best event I ever ever seen. Okay, and I travel a fair bit, the US and Europe and so on. And the, and the reason why this event is that has nothing to do with the people that stay here, because we are GNA, but it's about you guys. So there is something magic that is happening in Finland specifically. You know, I think what, if you look at the iTunes you know, chart speaks by itself, but I think in general in Europe, right? I mean, entrepreneurship and people like you are going to make this economy the economy of the future. And this is happening, and you guys are making it happen, and what is happening today in an event like this is a proxy of a much bigger European phenomenon that we are seeing across all the biggest European cities, London, Berlin, Stockholm, and so on. So, I mean, I think there is time also to be, to say that, right? I would like to comment on that too. I mean, if you think about, uh, I think Max mentioned before, it's very hard for European VCs to raise funds right now. However, I've never seen in my entire career as an investor more opportunities. I think all of us, I mean, Roberto said 500 deals per month. I mean, uh, all of us are, are bombarded right now with quality deals, and there's so few investors. So the opportunity now, because of the clusters in Berlin, here in Stockholm, et cetera, it's amazing what's happening now. So I think we could see, be in for a very interesting 10 years. So, Max, what, what do you want to see here next year? What's the next step forward, very quickly? Well, very quickly, I need to think about it. 
Um, you know, ideally, from like from an investment, from an organizational point of view, I had a ton of meetings here. But I think uh, I think as we develop slush and it, as it turns into an event with you know thousands of attendees and hundreds of companies, I think we need to find a way to structure the process so that that you guys are able to get in front of investors more easily than it is today, right? You know, I got this list of companies. Uh, I get, I went through and I selected the ones that I wanted to take a meeting. But I think if we if we had a way of um, of kind of having you get in touch that's easier than the current system and doing you know, a quick 10, 15 minute meeting, that would be phenomenal because I feel like there are so many companies here that I didn't get the chance to see and that's a pity. Okay, thanks. So the organizers know what to do. You know what these guys are looking for. They're looking for talent, not patterns. <laughs> uh, great products. Uh, so we'll meet here, here the next week and uh, uh, the next year, I mean. So uh, <laughs> thank you very much, and thank you for the panelists. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you, Mick. Thank you, guys. Excellent talk.